Holly. Talk earlier said, <clears throat> man, you're gonna listen to me talk. Uh, Chuck, they wouldn't listen to me when I was out there. How about that? <laughs> I'm gonna listen to me now. That's not the way I remember it. <laughs> okay, it is good to be with you folks. So uh, good to be any place when you're 90 years old. Uh, I turned big nine zero uh, last Thursday, and I'm trying to catch up with Milt Chambers. <laughs> I'm right behind you, Milt. Uh, see if I got my countdown here. You know, we have a rich uh, history in this country of uh, 400 years. Uh, 207, we celebrated 200 years, which was the, represented the founding of Jamestown, which is a, I think, recognized benchmark for American history. But, uh, so the 400 years of rich history. And we got about 60 years of that as space history. Some rich space history. I'm not sure how much rich space we're going to experience here in the near future, but uh, we have enjoyed a good ride. Uh, you know, uh, last time I made a little talk like this on the history of space, uh, <coughs> MC introduced me and as uh, working out at Kennedy Space Center for 40 years, and I really didn't know the guy, and I didn't know hardly anybody in the office. I mean in the audience, but uh, when I got up there to the podium like this, I said, I've never worked a day in my life at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I kind of shocked him and I knew I had to recover from that. And uh, the way you do it, if you like what you're doing, it ain't work. And I think a lot of you never worked at Kennedy Space Center, right? Right. Okay. the origin of our, uh, can you hear me back there? Uh, yes. Wayne, you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, one time somebody said something I can't hear you and somebody else said, well, you ain't missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, I think the origin of our rocket team that we started out with, it really goes back to the end of the war in uh, Europe. You know, the V-2 rocket team, that World War II, we recognized a new dimension of warfare with the V-2. And this was headed up by a young scientist named Werner von Braun. And I have a real good book on Werner von Braun here. We're gonna give it away. Uh, Chuck's gonna do that. And we got a special way we're gonna <coughs> drip it. The, but there's, a, there's some good stories in there. And. Uh, one, for example, uh, Mon Brown had a good sense of humor. And uh, some lady of Alabama, this before we went to the moon, she wrote him, you know, one of these letters that I think a lot of them are circulating. If God wanted a man on the moon, he'd put him there. And she told him that and said, beside that, I'll bet you a dollar you never make it. He wrote her back and said, uh, uh, <coughs> This Bible didn't say anything about not having a man on the moon, but it did say something about gambling. <laughs> uh, good material in there. You know, one of the smartest division, uh, decisions that we made in that period I'm talking about then, the World War II, was the Project Paperclip. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. That was the project that was headed by General Toftoy. And they brought Von Brown and about 120 of his guys to Fort Bliss, Texas. And, and, and of course, uh, Von Brown had, had uh, faked some papers and he filled a train of car after car of V2s and hardware, you know, uh, anticipating he'd be a, in the American camp and not the Russians. And so <clears throat> that was a great decision bring those guys over here, put them at Fort Bliss, you know, near White Sands Proving Ground. And then uh, we followed that great decision, one of the dumbest things we've ever done. For five years, we didn't give them anything meaningful, no project. 
In fact, Bron Brown later wrote, we wasted five years. They did do a fly some V2s. In fact, one of them went over El Paso and landed in a cemetery in uh, Mexico. Uh, you know that period of 45, 50, after World War II, our country was busy. You know, we wanted washing machines, cars, uh, Jim Walters homes, uh, silk hose, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's good. And we deserved it, but we also had enough money to do a space program, but we uh, completely neglected it. And uh, over in the USSR, they took a different approach. They didn't go for any of that stuff. And I can verify it because we've been over there a couple of times and they were living in that period like a third world country. I mean, third, third world. Of course, they had a tremendous space and the military thing, but they got some of the Germans that uh, von Brown's team, and they put them to work. And that period that we were idle, they had developed the second uh, generation of the V2, and they were working on a, a rocket 500 mile range, which was way beyond anything we were at at that time. So around 1950, the Korean War started, and uh, our guys smartened up a little bit in Washington, you know, and said, hey, them Soviets, uh, maybe they're up some. So we better start looking at defending ourselves. So at that time, they moved uh, Von Brown and his team to Huntsville, a Redstone Arsenal, and uh, chartered to develop the Redstone rocket, which was a uh, uh, 150 mile plus range with a carrying an atomic warhead and uh, Huntsville became a boom town. I mean, you know, I've, many of you have been there when it was a little cotton town on the square and it just exploded. And uh, a lot of the influx in there were young engineers just out of school, most of them Auburn, like Dick Smith and, and uh, Alabama, Georgia Tech. Tennessee, I hope I'm not leaving out one of your good all my models. I'm sure they were represented. And uh, so they went to work. And by uh, summer of 1953, they had a rocket ready to come to Florida. So in the meantime, Dr. Kurt Davis, and he was one of Von Brown's chief lieutenants, and uh, Dr. Gruner, my mentor for many years, uh, they were forming the Missile Firing Lab, which was the guys that were going to come down later and uh, launch the rocket. And so in August 20, 1953, we launched the first Redstone. A little bunker, much smaller, I mean, about as big as the corner of this room, over on uh, the Cape. And uh, it went out of sight in the clouds, and it went out of, <laughs> it went out of control. Uh, and we weren't learned a tremendous lesson. I, I could go into that, but uh, I don't think the time permits. And by the way, Chuck, if I start going too long, there was a safety issue here. Uh, I don't drive after dark. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> 1953 to uh, 1955, our little team would go back and forth. We would launch a rocket, back up our stuff. I'm talking about literally cleaning out the blockhouse because we shared that little bunker with the Beaumont, which was a missile the Air Force was working on. So we'd go back to Huntsville, follow the rocket through the static test stand and through the quality checkout and work with our design counterparts and then we come back down and launch it. And after every launch, especially the Germans, they like to party. So we'd have a party here. There weren't many places here then to have a party. But uh, and then we'd go to Huntsville and we'd get with our design counterparts up there, we'd have another party. And uh, no matter which way the rocket went, we claimed a little uh, partial success and celebrated. <laughs> uh, now, Redstone 3 blew up right on the pad, right as we were 
get an ignition and it sent a pressure wave through the cable tunnel and blew out some uh, stuffing we had in the wall where the cables came through and some of our guys got showered with a bunch of debris there. It was, no one was injured but it did uh, get our attention and uh, I'd say our celebration on that one was a little subdued. <laughs> uh, now one of the celebration parties in Huntsville I was set up with a blind date with a pretty little blonde <laughs> named Catherine, I think. I think that's right. <laughs> she worked with the data processing uh, section up there. And uh, four months later, we were married. And a few months later, we moved to Florida. That's the first contingent of the permanent uh, group that were coming uh, down to Florida. And so Brevard County in 1955, how many were here then? Wasn't anything like it is today. The, uh, they were short on housing. I mean real short. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Grinner, Dr. Davison, I, uh, they permitted us to live in the officer's quarters on uh, uh, Patrick. And we lived there for a couple of years and that was, that was pretty good. Now, another thing they weren't short on was mosquitoes. And you can count them like we do the deficit in the trillion. Uh, and another thing that got your attention was the water. It smelled like sulfur, tastes like sulfur, and it was. <laughs> on Cocoa Beach, nothing but a few mom and pop motels, but there was a, a surf club. That was a, and there's. One guy, a lot of us stayed a little place where the Polaris Hotel used to be, uh, called Winslow Beach, and and we prided ourselves on being real smart. That guy wanted to sell us some of that beachfront property for two hundred dollars an acre, <laughs> and we said, "What do you think we are, a bunch of stupid?" <laughs> I guess it's two hundred dollars a foot now. Of course, I didn't have two hundred dollars, so. Uh, right. Now, the work environment during that period, try to give you a little uh, feel for that, it was 24-7, by that I mean, ever what it required. Run a test, you keep going until you uh, finish or give up, and, and uh, we had no uh, set, you know, we didn't stop. 11 o'clock, it's time to go to lunch. We didn't do that, I mean, we... We uh, didn't stop for coffee breaks. We drank a lot of coffee, uh, but we didn't uh, we didn't take any coffee break. Now you can't write anything a uh, history of Cape uh, Canaveral in that era without mentioning the Roach Coach. <laughs> Chuck, I'm disappointed you didn't get to. <laughs> that was our nutrition wagon, uh -huh. and uh, it was uh, staffed by. Two ladies, uh, two big ladies, Marilyn and Hortense. And, uh, man, they could make a sailor blush. <laughs> and their coffee, you could uh, float a spoon in it. But uh, during that period, we didn't know any better, so we had minimum paperwork. We didn't know you were supposed to have a bunch of regulation and all that kind of crap. And uh, we depended on uh, individual responsibility. If you say it's ready to go, that's all I need. I don't need a piece of paper with 50 signatures on it that 49 of them don't know what, what it's all about. In our culture, we weren't politically uh, educated. I mean, that wasn't in our vocabulary. And I'll give you a couple, three examples of that. Dr. Davis called a meeting one day in his conference room. This is over on the Cape. He says, what I'm saying here is top secret. What I say stays in this room, and it better not get out of this room. And uh, so he started to talk, and one of the guys, a good friend of mine and yours, he's deceased now, he used to be a regular, but he's the guy that said what he thought. He said, Dr. Davis, you can't start the meeting now. I said, why not? She's still here. So, you know a woman can't keep a secret. <laughs> uh, 
That was Billy Fitzgerald, the only female in our organization that time. She's a successful real estate lady now up in Titusville. And one of the four people I know that are still alive from that uh, team. And uh, another, this in uh, tell on myself now, I don't like to be so introspective here, but uh, I was a pretty heavy uh, cigar smoker back in that era, some of you know, and someone, someone gave me a cigar lighter, it was a pretty good size, about like a pack of cigarettes, and it had a little musical thing in it that would play Dixie. <laughs> and uh, every morning I was the one that came in the blockhouse, opened it up, and put power on the muscle, and we'd announce over the PA system to the guys out on the pad, missiles powered up and you're ready to go to work. And uh, to get their attention first, I'd go to the mic, put the volume all the way up, and put my little uh, Dixie on there. <laughs> and Dixie went all over the pad and all over the cape. I'm not sure I could do that now. <laughs> and another thing I did innocently, yes, can I say that, uh, that I'd probably get fired for today, uh, my good friend Grady Williams, some of you know Grady, he was head of instrumentation and telemetry in that time, he's passed away. But Grady called me and says, I right, you got any spaces over there? And our terminology in that time was space meant you had a vacancy and you were authorized to fill it. I said, yeah, Grady, we're looking for several good men. Uh, he said, well, I've got a guy over here I interview and he's got a real good credentials and personnel will send him over here and I don't have any spaces. I don't know why they're sending him, but uh, I think you ought to talk to him. He's got real good credentials. And uh, I felt something was Sort of missing her. I said, Grady, anything else? He says, yeah, I guess I ought to tell you this. He's 52 years old. I said, Grady, you know we can't hire an old guy like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was serious. And so he, uh, he talked me in. I did an interview him. I did hire him. I was right. He didn't fit in. And uh, he was a good man, and we got him into another department where he, he flowered. Most of you know him, I told you. Uh, and uh, many of you know uh, just Rocco Patron. <laughs> Rocco was assigned to the, Rocco was the captain that time in the military. And there ain't but one Rocco Patron. You know, he was a great football player at West Point, had a uh, master's in MIT. And Ro uh, Rocco had, uh, discipline was a virtue with Rocco. In my marine background, that was a virtue with me. And uh, we, uh, we lived on the shoestring then. We didn't have any facilities at pad. We had a shop truck. And we had some super good mechanics. Uh, they might butcher the King's English sometimes, but uh, they were good. And they didn't have tools all scattered around there, and Rocco came through. I want this place cleaned up. I'm coming back. Better be clean. Came back. Everything was clean. They had some drawers. You know, you go in the aisle on drawers. Here's a drawer. Big ranches, R-E-N-C-H-E-S. <laughs> Another drawer. Little ranches, R-E-N-C-H-E-S. Uh, and, uh, I learned something about Dr. Davis in that period too. He's one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Uh, one night in countdown, I was, I was sick as, Alabama phrase, I was sick as a horse. And uh, I told Dr. Gruner, I said, I'm going out, the, our sport medically was the Army. They had old Army ambulance out there. I said, Dr. Gruner, I'm going out here and lay down this uh, uh, ambulance just for a little while. I think I'll be better. And uh, a little while somebody said, Ike, is that you? I recognized Dr. Davis. I thought, man, I'm in deep yogurt now. He says, I want to get my driver and send you home. You shouldn't be out here, all these mosquitoes. And uh, I argued with him. I said, Dr. Davis, I'll be all right. No, I want to send you home. I finally talked him in and let me stay because 
I really didn't want them to know that they could launch without me. <laughs> the, the point is, he had compassion for his troops. He really did. Um, now, a little bit about the workforce. Uh, now, this, I'm telling you the way it is. I'm not telling you the way it should be or whatever. It was all white. It was all male. There were no minorities. And that's just the way it was at that time. And they were all young. Now, youth has a, you know, today that's much different. Most of the high, you know, places uh, now in KSC or anywhere in industry is, that's problem is going away. But the uh, uh, youth is, a, I think, a virtue in uh, projects like we were, uh, the experimental uh, rocketry, because when you're young, you're not afraid of failure. You take a little kid, Tim's got a little kid, uh, learn how to walk, uh, room full of people, he falls, tumbles, and if he doesn't get hurt, we all laugh. Doesn't embarrass him, he gets up, goes again. So a kid learns, a young kid learns how to walk by falling. Now translate that to the human thing. You know, people are like organizations. The older you get, and I've seen this in the industry and the government, the older you get, the more baggage you pick up. The more baggage you pick up, it impedes your capability to progress. Because you get older, and I'll mention an example of this a little later, you know, you think, well, golly, here's a big decision. If, if, uh, if I'm wrong, I'm going to look bad. So uh, what's the answer? A committee. And I'll show you later where that's. That ain't the answer. Because <laughs> you get like some of the things you hear on TV today. Big problem, but ain't nobody responsible. Uh, so we got to the moon by failures. We learned from our failures. We don't learn from our successes. And it's kind of hard to say this, but the fire at uh, Complex 34 back in January 1967 when we lost three astronauts is an example of this. Uh, this was a disaster waiting, you know, the situation we had with the spacecraft at that time. And it, it occurred later, and I've heard astronauts say this, that, you know, out on the way to the moon or something, it would have been much more a devastating thing because you wouldn't have the hardware here to look at to determine what happened. And of course, out of that, we got a much uh, safer spacecraft with all the changes they made, you know, for example, open the door from out, out, not, not in. And, uh, you know, in the 50s, uh, the Cape was very active in launches. In fact, you go out to watch a launch, uh, one thing you'd look around, where is something I can get under in case this thing <laughs> comes up? And that's true. Uh, we're a hard hat. In fact, there was a project right next to our little uh, bunker over there. It's called a snark. And man, they all had all kinds of trouble with that. Sometimes it could get to the water, and we referred to it as a snark infested uh, beach there because all that debris uh, was washing up. We had another one there called a Navajo. Navajo. We named it the Never Go because it never did go. <laughs> And uh, they had a missile graveyard out there where they'd collect all the, did you know as a rocket would crash, we call them inner pad rockets. Uh, they'd gather up debris and pack it. And I'll say before, we were working on a shoestring. We'd go over there occasionally and go through the dump just to see what, get a cable here or a meter here or whatever that we could uh, salvage. Uh, Maybe a little biased, but I think in that period we had the most reliable record. But we did have our problems too. Uh, I know Redstone, I think it was 25, it went up beautifully a few hundred feet, went horizontal, headed straight for central control. And the central control is where they monitor if the vehicle's on track. If it doesn't stay between the lines, they blow it up. So coming toward them, uh, 
rest assured they pushed the button and it did blow it up. And uh, we went back to Hangar D where our telemetry station and didn't have much data, just a few seconds. Remember, we poured over that and couldn't find anything. And Dr. Diva said, let's go home, come back early in the morning and see if we can find the problem. And so I went home, I, I couldn't sleep. I was all things run through my mind. It might be this or that. So I came back early and I came into the lobby of the VA, uh, e and l building over there, guard several people over there. And my good friend Johnny, he was a janitor there. He called me over and said, it's not like I want to talk to you. And so went over and said, what is Johnny? He says, I know what happened to that missile last night. I said, you do? Yes, sir. And I said, well, what is it? Well, first he said, I know you and I know Dr. Davis and you would never let a rocket do that. I said, you're right, Johnny, we'd never let one do that. And he said it was them communist. <laughs> now, they were operating, you know, out of Cuba, and they did have their boats out there, and we were always concerned they could get into our destruction. But uh, I agreed with him that we'd never let one do that. And uh, I got a picture of another one. Oh, here it is. This is a Jupiter, and... Uh, the sky is up here. Can you see the <laughs> rockets going up <laughs> this way? Now, that was embarrassing because uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Edward R. Murrow. He's the Cronkite of that era. And he was doing a documentary. He followed this rocket from the assembly in Huntsville down here. And we were going to put on our best show, you know, show him what it's like. In fact, he was in the blockhouse looking out the window and this thing went up over and fried a few rattlesnakes <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we learned uh, something out of that in fact uh, I'd say every uh, failure we did and one rocket we uh, developed in that uh, 50s time frame was the Jupiter rocket it was our RBM 1500 mile range and these rockets were deployed in, uh, after they were certified in Italy and on, in Turkey on the borders of Russia. And uh, the Turkish and the Italian troops would go to Huntsville, go to school. They come down here on the Cape and under our supervision, they'd launch a rocket. And they, these rockets, they came in later in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, you know, when we were on the I mean, I'm telling you, we were on the brink of nuclear war. Yeah. Kennedy and Khrushchev were, you know, who's going to, who's going to blink? And they, uh, you know, they ended up, Khrushchev take his missiles out of Cuba. We would not invade Cuba. And it was never published at that time, and I don't know why, but uh, uh, part of that deal was dismantle our Jupiter missiles on the border of uh, Turkey, which they did. Now, let me go back a little bit. In early 1952, a group of scientists across the world, several, several hundred of them, determined they want to have something called International Geophysical Year. And that was going to be in a year, actually it was about 18 months. It was going to be in 1957, 1958, where they study uh, the ocean, the Arctic, Antarctic, uh, uh, volcanoes, uh, everything you can think of, and they wanted to study the upper atmosphere. And they asked the nations of the world, can you give us an artificial moon? And uh, the USSR said, yeah, we'll do it. And, then, and our president, President Eisenhower, said, yes, we will. Now, I was Eisenhower man, but somebody gave him some real bad advice. Now get back to the committee. He formed a committee, first mistake. And uh, they were asked to look at three uh, configurations. One was a Vanguard, which would be a totally civilian hardware little thing and put up a satellite, not like a moon. But in all due respect, they had not ever a chance to certify that. I mean, that was gonna be the first launch. 
And the uh, second was the Atlas, which is today a very reliable workhorse, but at that time it had never flown and it had uh, real problems in their development phase, as many of you out here know. And then the Jupiter C, which is uh, the elongated redstone with some upper stages of uh, JPL, and we had flown that in some uh, preparation for certifying that other Jupiter in it. And we'd flown it 3,500 miles downstream, 600 mile altitude and altitude, and and it was a reliable piece of hardware. All you had to do to put a satellite in orbit is put that four stage on there, and the four stage was just like the second. The second was a cluster of 12. The third stage was a cluster of three of those rocks. The fourth would be a single. You put that on there, and you got something in orbit. And Von Braun and uh, General Madaris, uh, he was the head of, he was Von Braun's boss. Uh, they'd been to Washington several times trying to talk to those people in. We can put a satellite up there. No, not only no, but hell no. So Von Braun, don't you ever put a fourth stage on that uh, thing. And so uh, the committee selected the uh, Vanguard. I, again, I'm saying they're putting pressure on those guys. They've never flown this, so the, the first one, well, let me go back a little bit, uh, or go up a little bit. On uh, October 4th, 1957, everything changed. You heard the beep, beep, beep of Sputnik. Here we are, greatest nation in the world, leader in technology, Everything you can think of, culture, goodies and all that. And here's a backward <coughs> communist country. It's got a satellite, the first moon, artificial moon. And you don't think that was devastating, embarrassing, frustrating, anything you want to do. I remember a group of us out the, I was out the pad when that came. And, uh, Jim White, one of our guys, you know, uh, turned on the receiver and picked up that beep beep, and that was, oh, that was devastating. And Khrushchev, the uh, Soviet, got a lot of mileage out of that. They got accolades from every nation in the world. Look, look how great you are. And uh, then they liked that, and a month later on November 3rd, they sort of rubbed it in our nose a little more. They launched a heavier satellite with a Laika a female dog, then that really, <laughs> you know, was heartbreaking. And so in December 6th of that year, I'm talking about 57, we launched the Vanguard and it uh, had the problem, it exploded, left off, and that was a real bad day for America. And so at that time, then Washington told uh, Von Brown and uh, General Madaris, okay, look, go launch your rocket. And uh, a little irony on this thing, uh, uh, at the time, uh, the first news of getting out about the orbit, Gordon Harris, and, and some of you know who I'm talking about here, up in Knoxville, the reporters came to him, we want to know what Von Braun and Madaris held. And at that time, they were entertaining the Secretary of Defense and you and Neil McElroy out at the officers club at, at the Redstone Arsenal. And I won't repeat what Madaris said, but uh, Von Brown got McElroy over there and gave him a real lecture on, you know, what we can do. And I think that paid off. But I thought it a little uh, timely <laughs> that when they had been trying to sell this up there and then the moment it's in orbit, uh, it gets a chance to do that. Now, um, the reaction of Congress was almost a panic. You know, what's happened here? Um, what are we going to do? Concerned about security, about uh, education, what happened to our science, math? And it was, uh, so they really came into action out of the defense. They, begin to pour money into the educational. And uh, so in 
so that was, uh, in fact, on that, Kelly was down range. I think he pushed the button to trigger the second stage. That's right. And it went into higher orbit. Kelly, I don't know if you did that or not, but I drill did. some gripping because you're going to pick the signal up at Goldstone and the time it was going to pick it up, it didn't appear. And it was a few minutes late. But on uh, January 31st, 1958, we launched successfully the Explorer. Now, uh, in 1961, I mean, yeah, April, uh, Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, went into orbit. That was another blow to our pride and, and a concern that uh, how secure are we? And uh, three weeks later on May the uh, 5th, 1961, we launched Shepard in the suborbital flight. And uh, three weeks later on May 25th, 1961, President Kennedy made this statement, we're going to the moon, we're going in this decade, we're going there, put them on safe and bring them back safe. Now, man, what, what a, I don't know how to describe our reaction to that, but uh, uh, prior to that, I guess you could equate us to speed like a little mom and pop operation. Next day we're Walmart, General Motors, I mean. You know, all the activity prior to that was over on the Cape. And uh, after that, well, first let me say the, the first thing that occurred then Where's the moon port going to be? And the Air Force says, we'll buy some more land over there, and uh, that'll be the moon port. Dr. Davidson guys looked at it and said, it ain't big enough. Uh, we need something larger. And uh, another, uh, Merritt Island was not, you know, a given. The Kings Point, just north of, well, I mean, north of Jacksonville, southern Georgia, and the Georgia people made a strong pitch. The uh, moon port would uh, be at Kings Point. And I think Brownsville, Texas uh, was a candidate. Of course, Lyndon Johnson was in Texas, so you had to watch that. Uh, but anyway, I think Dr. Davis, as far as I know, was the same head that you know, got to Kennedy by Merritt Island. That would be Kennedy Space Center. Of course, it wasn't named Kennedy at that time. But if you... Uh, Think about the time, May the 25th, 1961, seven and a half years later, Frank Borman was circling the moon on Apollo 8, reading from the book of Genesis from space. And uh, I would say in today's atmosphere, you couldn't do that in a hundred years, what we did from 60, 61 to uh, 68. You know, we weren't organized. You, you had strong leaders. I've got pictures of some of them here. Pete Center, uh, Bob Gilruth at JSC, uh, Werner von Braun, Dr. Davis, others. I mean, and of course, they all wanted, they all had their idea, let's go this way. And, and, uh, and then had to have a strong NASA management and, and, that's like in a lot of places today as a strong leader. Uh, <coughs> but uh, fortunately we had one. Jim Webb, I think, was one of the best we ever had. I'm not talking about Senator from, from Virginia, this is an older guy. But he knew how to work the Congress, he knew how to work the executive office, he knew industry, he knew government, and he was the one who could get resources. And they called in uh, Dr. George Mueller and uh, General Phillips. And they drew up a plan and told each center, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, this is the way we're going. And uh, that worked beautiful. Uh, I like uh, Dr. Miller, you know. Uh, let me say, and I'll mention this later, the workforce, again, I'll say at that time, and I'm just saying that's the culture of the way the nation was, the, there were no females in any management, you know, they were secretaries and so on. But uh, Dr. Miller knew the uh, what the wives contributed to this 
to the program, but <coughs> this area was one of the booming, fastest growing in the country at that time, and also one of the highest divorce rates. He came down periodically. He would hold a tea for the wives, and he would give them an overall uh, view of the program. I know Catherine enjoyed that, and I think all the wives did. I thought that was a smart thing. And you know that they had to make some quick decisions. The moon concept, some of them, let's, uh, let's Earth orbit and go to the moon. Another, no, go on the moon in orbit. And uh, each one of them had valid arguments. They got them up in Huntsville in a six hour close the door, six hour meeting, and they decided which way they'd go. Out of that, you know, you forget your arguments, you go, we'll all line up and do the same thing. Now you spend a whole career studying the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the design of Complex 39. You know, nobody had ever designed the moon for it. What does it look like? And that's where Dr. Davis comes in. Uh, I can't say enough good words about he and Dr. Rune and those folks. But, uh, you know, do you assemble this rocket on the launch pad? Do you assemble it off in the building? If you assemble it off, how do you get it to the pad? You know, there's things, well, we'll go there in the barge. We'll dig a canal. Well, that was one option. We got a rubber tire uh, machine. And uh, then Dr. Davis uh, got a plane load, went up to a strut mine up in Kentucky where they had one of these huge machines, I guess as big as this room, you know, uh, where the strut mine in coal and that crawler concept, you know, the treads. That's where that came from. And so uh, it, it was just, I mean, you had to make decisions, had to, had to go. And they had the people to do it. Uh, now, one of the smart things Dr. Davis did back then, he called Rocco Patron, I mentioned him earlier, he called Rocco back. I was glad to see that, I was a good friend of Rocco. Now, Rocco, uh, I say he considered discipline a virtue. And that guy, uh, I'll say this with all sincerity. If it hadn't been for Rocco Patron, I'm not sure we'd have made <coughs> the timing on the launch that we did. He set up firing room four. You know, we had four firing rooms there, and four was not activated. We couldn't use it that early. All across the wall, I had the perch charts. You know what I'm talking about? The waterfall, this block here, this block here, this block's got to be completed before this. And each block had a name, had somebody responsible if it wasn't producing. And you go with that guy someplace in the room, he had, a, he had his little block with his breakdown. So he went on down and, and so you could, uh, every day you could see how we're doing as far as getting uh, to the moon, how we're making it. And uh, there's problems every day. I mean, uh, we had, uh, change the way we were working. Uh, prior to that, we were, we were do it yourself. We didn't have a contractor. We were beginning to get into that. But uh, we became more of an integration thing, you know, and Marshall was, uh, when I say Marshall, I'm talking about Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. They were letting in contracts with their booster rockets and, and uh, Johnson Space Center in uh, Houston was the uh, command module and uh, lunar module and uh, our contracts here had to tie in with that and uh, when it got to VAB you know that was a concept bring the stages into the low bay check them out and then stack them in the high bay and uh, Marshall guys are great guys but we always had some conflicts with them they wanted their contract to say that they would own the stage through the low bay checkout and then they give it to us at high bay and Dr. Renner won there ain't no way that's going to happen so he was a principal that got that turned around but uh, we had uh, you know the contracts uh, the way they were worded we had a pretty good grip on it 
because it was, you know, like an award fee. You get a fee, and then we could get some subjective, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, but we grade them to see what kind of fee they got. And uh, that's, that's where we had the leverage because all the managers here want to make a profit to keep his job because his boss come down, how you doing? And uh, so uh, we had uh, we had a pretty pretty good grip on it. We had a good team. We had a tremendous team of contractors and uh, uh, NASA people. Uh, the biggest problem we had with NASA people, we had mechanics and technicians, electrical techs, and then the new concept. We didn't do any hands-on, so we had to convert them to quality people, quality control, which was a logical thing, but some of them couldn't adjust, adjust, didn't want to. In fact, one of those big guys came in to me, he was crying. He said, you just don't trust me. You know I've been doing good work. I said, Herb, it ain't that. This is, you know, the way we've got to operate. Now, you know, I consider uh, the Apollo the greatest human achievement in the history of man. We launched nine rockets, no failures in launch vehicle. And this hardware, remember this was built in 1960, hardware. We didn't have solid state. We had relays, stepping switches, tape recorders, moving parts, and all the time, anytime you got moving parts, your reliability goes down. We had a primitive computer that uh, Tim Dietz there, he knows, it fill up this room pretty close. <laughs> and uh, there's RCA 110 uh, computer. And uh, one of the challenges we had on uh, rockets back then that with the computer saw was all the red lines, and Frank knows what I'm talking about there. There's hundreds of values, you know, that you've got to be uh, you can't be below this, you can't be above that, pressure, temperature, uh, RPMs, uh, flow rate, whatever it is, and you got to have guys, several hundred in that big firing room with the authority, if things are out, to call cutoff, and then how long do you give them that authority? You know, you get down to a second or two before liftoff, the more dangerous to, I think you know what I'm I mean, that's one Norm Carlson with Gene Sestil. We know how we uh, fought that uh, thing. And it was, uh, it was amazing that we could get the countdowns off uh, on time like we did because the first uh, countdown demonstration test we, used, we tried, it took us 17 days. I mean, 17 days to finally get the green lights to say, yeah, we could have launched if we were launching. And uh, I might add, uh, in the firing room is a, you know, big firing room is a room between, and we call that the woodshed. If we had a problem, uh, Dr. Phoebus Rocco take us into the woodshed where we had to explain <laughs> what the problem was. And the group out there would see us go in the woodshed. They say, "Oh, oh, something, something ain't right." <coughs> and uh, it was late in the uh, Apollo program before we uh, really broke through the barrier of uh, the females and the minorities in the in the control room. Uh, Joanne, I guess Joanne Morgan's not here, but Joanne was the first first one, as I recall, first female in there. And the first minority we had was a guy named Reamer Prince. And Reamer, he was a software guy. And at that time, we didn't have many good software guys. We couldn't even pronounce it. Uh, but uh, the 110A computer I'm talking about, here's a, here's a mother, motherboard of this, and there were several hundred of these in each computer. We had one computer in the control room, one in the mobile launcher. And they had a generic problem with these, and we sweated out for months how that thing was going. But one night to count down, uh, we had a problem, and, and uh, 
Dr. Davis wanted an explanation. I went over, told him what I knew and what was much, and he wanted more. And uh, so I called uh, a guy called Frank Penovich. Frank was the head of our computer. He was in that back room. I said, Frank, you need to come up here and explain this problem to uh, Dr. Davis. I've given it my best shot, and I uh, can't go any further. He says, I want to send Raymer. I said, Frank, I think you need to come up here. He said, well, I think uh, Raymer knows more about this than I do. I said, okay, if you say. <coughs> so Raymer came up there, you know, the blockhouse, I mean the control room, upper step. Raymer came up, I introduced him to Dr. Davis. I said, Raymer, uh, Dr. Davis wants to know things on this thing. So Raymer innocently, he started talking bits and bytes and gates and gigabytes. And I tell Dr. Davis, he's like, I want to eat it out of the He finally says, how long is it going to take you to fix it? <laughs> and uh, uh, Raymer gave him his best guess, and I hate it. Uh, he went back to Washington. He, I think he moved up the line, but really hate to see him go. He was really a quality guy. Uh, you know, one big difference in the, uh, well, let me, let me tell one other. Standing here and I've got to wind this thing up. It's getting dark out there. <laughs> uh, the biggest nightmare I guess I had in the whole space program, uh, George Fianza called me one day, and many of you know George. He was head of the McDonnell Douglas and head of the uh, S4B section. And he says, I've got a problem. I want to talk to you. I said, go ahead, George, because George and I talked all the time. That really wasn't uncommon. And uh, he says, I want to talk to you over the phone. I want to come over and talk to you. And I could tell in his voice, he was a little up concerned. I said, okay, come on over, George. In the meantime, we have our NASA guys embedded in all these operations, and I called our guy on S4B, a guy named Bill Mahoney. I said, Bill, what are you working out there? He went over several little things, you know, kind of like in the noise level. I said, is that all? Yeah. And Bill knew, I, many times I knew before George did what kind of problems he had because our guys, you know, were good at bringing those up the line. So George came over, he pulled some pictures out there, and the pictures were the, of the men's room in the S4B area of the uh, low bay, and on the, you know, the sinks and then the mirrored wall, and on there, it written, uh, I'll fix the rocket, it'll never fly, ha, ha, ha. And, and you know, and George said he had already called his corporate security people. And uh, of course, I knew immediately well, I had to go up the line. I went to Dr. Greer, we went uh, <coughs> to Rocco and on up to Dr. Davis. He got Charlie Buckley in. George gave us all he, he had. He tried to find out who had been in the room. And uh, uh, that was leading us no place. And so we were in a real dilemma because. This was in the low bay and checking it out there getting ready to stack and uh, this is in the Apollo program and uh, There was no backup you couldn't put that one aside and say we'll take this one because it didn't exist and uh, So we you know what in the world are we gonna do here? We tried to keep it quiet and I think we did a pretty good job of that Well, we instituted some more inspections is, is a, how you say it, not to alarm people, but, and then some retests, and our first decision had to make, are we going to stack this thing? Not knowing, because in the, in the, in the Apollo, or in fact all the shuttle, all of them today, have a very formal flight readiness review. And each one got to get up there and say, here's the problem I had, here's the way I fixed it. And heaven forbid if you ever have, we had one category, unexplained anomalies. You had one of those, you had to give a rationale why I say a safe fly. And I was the one that gave that 
readiness review for the launch vehicle. And uh, of course, I didn't want to face that. And uh, so that went on for several days, and you know that just consumed us. So, and uh, finally, George. I mean, he was a lady. He came in. It turned out that uh, one of the guys, one of their best guys, had done that. He had uh, had some design guys from uh, uh, Huntington Beach over here, and uh, they went out with a three martini dinner, lunch, and came back and was going to have a little fun. And, uh, you know, they're going to check up a few people, and they come in and say, oh, I did that. And they saw it immediately, you know, got so elevated, the guy was frightened. But uh, I guess that, I'm telling you, that was a, a nightmare during that period. And uh, George said that, that was one of his best guys. Uh, they didn't fire him, they transferred him back to the West Coast. Uh, so, uh, I see this page blank, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, is, is that uh, the future program? <laughs> I would just humbly say that uh, I have a, I feel we have a close bonding in this group. Uh, and as your email the other day said, we're blessed to have worked in the space program. And uh, I just don't know what to say. <laughs> Ike has a book here, he's going to give away, and it looks like a great one. 